Good afternoon. My name is Eileen McIntyre, and I am the chair of the Education Committee for the Hingham Historical Society. Welcome to this second program in the Society's 2022-2023 lecture series titled Native Homelands, Settler Colonialism. I have the pleasure of introducing our speaker this afternoon. Professor Robert Miller is joining us live from Arizona, and you'll see him on screen in a moment. Professor Miller is faculty director of the Rosette LLP American Indian Economic Development Program at the Sandra Day O'Connor College of Law, Arizona State University. In 2019, the law school honored Professor Miller by naming him a Willard H. Pedrick Distinguished Research Scholar. In addition to his law school roles, Bob's, Bob serves as interim chief justice of the Pasqua Yaqui Tribe Court of Appeals. He is an enrolled citizen of the Eastern Shawnee Tribe. In 2014, Professor Miller was elected to the American Philosophical Society, the oldest learned society in the United States created by Benjamin Franklin in 1743. Bob speaks regularly on Indian law issues across the US and abroad. And among his published work is Native America Discovered and Conquered, Thomas Jefferson, Lewis and Clark and Manifest Destiny, a book published in 2006. Of particular interest for the topic today is a book that Bob co-authored, Discovering Indigenous Lands, the Doctrine of Discovery in the English Colonies, which was published in 2010. Thank you, Professor Miller, for being part of the Native Homeland Settler Colonialism Lecture Series. We are so honored to welcome you to our virtual stage at the Hingham Historical Society this afternoon. And Bob, over to you. Thank you very much, Eileen, and thank you everyone there at the Historical Society that was involved with inviting me. Um, I'm speaking you, to you today at, about international law and how that was used to claim for England the lands in New England and the lands where you're all living in Massachusetts. And then we will discuss a little bit how the United States borrowed these same international law claims to claim against indigenous peoples, the rights the United States claims over Indian tribes to this very day. So as a good lawyer, a good law professor, I want to start with a caveat. I am not a historian. And, uh, you know, will I even say something wrong historically today? Will you guys call me out if I do? But I am a law professor. And what I am presenting to you is a new lens, a new way to look at history through the lens of the law. And I think you will find this quite fascinating because every aspect of history, especially when we talk about the Western Hemisphere and colonization of the indigenous peoples in Africa, East Asia, and in the Western Hemisphere, European countries were using and developing international law to make legal claims to the lands and sovereignty and power over the peoples that had lived there for thousands and thousands of years. I've written articles on Chile and Brazil and on East Africa and how countries like England, Germany, Spain and Portugal used this international law to claim those areas of the earth. And so today we're talking about early American history, early European history in the United States and the New England colony and then what you all folks became the Massachusetts Bay Colony. So I think when we're done, you're I hope you're will have a new view on many historical events. The first book I wrote that Eileen just mentioned is largely about the Lewis and Clark expedition and what President Thomas Jefferson intended Lewis and Clark to do in claiming where I was born and raised, the Oregon country, Portland, Oregon. And the United States was making legal claims to that country, that territory. And for some strange reason, Meriwether Lewis carried a branding iron with him when he crossed the country. And when they crossed the Rocky Mountains, if you read the Lewis and Clark journals carefully, you will see that they start using this branding iron in the Pacific Northwest in what was called then the Oregon country. They were definitely making legal claims for the United States to that territory. And so we're really going far enough back in history today and law to see how this doctrine developed 
what we call in the United States and most of the world calls it the doctrine of discovery. But it is without question the international law of colonialism. And that's what I'm going to talk about today and then really end up my talk with the, Massachusetts, the charter for the Massachusetts Bay Colony. And I hope I will have convinced you by then, and just like this was a trial and you're my jury and I'm trying to prove with historic fact and legal fact my, <clears throat> my thesis, my premise today. So let's see. Did that, let's see if the slides are going to work. There, miracle. We are going way back in history, folks. Spain and Portugal, today we might be surprised to think of them as world powers, but they were world powers at this time. They developed the early technology, the early ships, uh, the Portuguese caravels that could sail out of the sight of land and the whatever you call that stuff. The I don't even know what you call that, but navigational tools to be able to leave land and travel to distant areas. And they began finding island chains. The Canary Islands is what I'm talking about with you right now in the 1430s. And Spain and Portugal began to contest who could control the Canary Islands. Never mind that there were Canary Island peoples living there. And so they turned not unexpectedly to the Pope to settle their claims to the Canary Islands. And in 1436, Pope Nicholas II really begins what people say is the international law of exploration and colonization by European countries. And he issues Romanus Pontifex, really granting the Canary Islands to Portugal, granting sovereignty, jurisdiction, and title, and the obligations to convert and civilize these allegedly wild Canary Island savages. And I already used some phrases that you probably know from American history were used against the indigenous peoples of North America. So Portugal, in the intervening uh, decades, started exploring down the west coast of Africa. And Portugal once again turned to the Pope to verify, certify Portugal's claims to the western hump, I guess you'd call it, uh, of Africa. And the Pope issued, a new Pope issued more. Oh, I misspoke. Eugenius II was the Pope that issued the papal bull in 1436. So now Nicholas V is the Pope, and Portugal turns there. 1452, 1453, and this one I'm going to show you a little text from in 1455. Now granted Portugal sovereignty, jurisdiction, title, and the obligation to convert and civilize these wild savages, these pagans, is what the text you will see in a second, the, these pagans of Africa into Christians. Now, I'm going to show you, a, you can read this. I'm not going to read this aloud to you, but here's a pretty important piece of this papal bull in 1455, which is about the west coast of northwest Africa. I don't know how fast you read, maybe you're speed readers, but uh, this is the exact quote of part of this papal bull and what the Vatican was granting to the king of Portugal. The right to Saracens was their word at that time for Muslims and pagans to convert them, to take all their property, to take all movable and immovable goods. And look at that line, reduce them to slavery. I literally had a discussion with a documentarian this morning that wants to connect the doctrine of discovery to slavery. Well, I think you have it right there to take Africans and enslave them and use them wherever. And I do believe it's the Portuguese and the Dutch and later the English that primarily shipped uh, African peoples into slavery in the Caribbean and, and then in the US and elsewhere. That's a pretty dramatic statement. Why did the Pope have this kind of power over the kingdoms of Africa? I think most of us are unaware of the legal governmental regimes that existed for thousands of years in Africa, the well-recognized kings that exercised the same kind of sovereignty and the same kind of power that European kings did. But according to Spain and Portugal and the church, they were not Christians. And so they had no rights and Christians could travel to foreign lands and take what they wanted. 
And remember what this bull also said, uh, granted to the king of Portugal sovereignty, jurisdiction, and title to the lands, merely because these people were non-European, non-Christians. So Columbus, if you know your history, when Columbus showed up at the court of King Isabel and Ferdinand and said, I can go west and I will encounter lands. The king of Spain was very interested, the king and queen, because they had been cut out of all these papal bulls. They had all been in Portugal's favor. And now, in essence, all of the continent of Africa was granted to Portugal. So when Columbus shows up and says, hey, I can go to the west and I can find lands, they were happy to fund his expedition. Now, most of us were taught in school, and I'm sure you were taught the same thing, that Columbus was just going to look for a good price on cinnamon and pepper and salt. Well, there's a legal term for that. That's BS. Uh, the, the, the king and queen, Ferdinand and Isabel, signed seven contracts, seven documents with Columbus. Only the last one even mentioned spices and possibly going as far as Japan and China and what they what they called it the Japans at the time and to try to acquire spices the main goal was to seek lands in the west that the that the Spanish empire could absorb in fact in the first contract Columbus signed with Ferdinand and Isabella they said and this is a quote we will make you the admiral over any lands you acquire for us period, close quote. Columbus's goal was to seek new lands, new treasures, new riches, and new empires. So where does he land? I always, what, San Salvador and Hispanola in the Caribbean, he immediately kidnaps a few people, he grabs a few things that look like crops, et cetera, and he races back to Spain. Look what I found. I told you I could find it. Now let's claim it. So Isabella and Ferdinand sent their attorneys these are the good guys of the story, their attorneys. That's a joke from a law professor. Sent their attorneys to Rome now to get papal bulls in Spain's favor. And this is what Pope Alexander VI issued in 1493. You can read that. Intercatera Divinia. And now we're starting to see the development of elements, what I have defined as elements of this international law doctrine of discovery. Look what the Pope said. Any lands undiscovered by others. Well, who were these others? Because there were indigenous native peoples and in native empires in the West, in, in the Western Hemisphere. So what the Pope meant, of course, undiscovered by other Christians, other Christian nations. Spain was also granted sovereignty, jurisdiction, and title, but with the duty to convert and allegedly to civilize the indigenous peoples there. Uh, in 1493, Alexander VI issued three papal bulls in favor of Spanish uh, conquest and colonization in the Western Hemisphere. And here's Intercaterra II. What were we all taught in school? Another, I guess, I don't know what you call it, a fable, a fraud, that Columbus was afraid he was going to sail off the edge of the world. Look at this. The Pope knew about the, the North and the South Pole in 1493, and probably for 100, I don't know, it, long before that. And the Pope drew a line in the Atlantic Ocean to divide Portugal's rights under those earlier papal bulls, which was mostly Africa, India, and the Far East, and Spain's rights in this newly discovered Western Hemisphere. Again, you can see uh, the idea of first discovery. If you, Spain, are the first to discover lands in this area, then you could claim them. But there again is the duty to carry out this holy and laudable work of expanding Christianity. So I'm going to show you a map now, folks. If any of you have been uh, in your schooling, studied international history, you would have heard the, of the line of demarcation. I never took any international law classes, and I dare that most people, I dare to guess that most people in the world, if you ask them, what does the line of demarcation mean? I bet most would not know. That line is this line that the Pope drew in 1493, and I have a map to show you. The dotted line is the line that Alexander VI drew in that Intercaterra II papal bull. 
Now, if you don't, if you're unfamiliar with papal bulls, these are orders from the Vatican, orders from the Pope, excuse me. Uh, and any Christian leader, any Christian person is put on notice that they can be excommunicated if they violate these laws, these rules that the Pope has just issued. So this papal bull drew this line. And you can see that Portugal was unhappy. Well, you can't see from this line, but I will tell you that Portugal was very unhappy because Portugal and Spain assumed there were lands, extensive lands in the West. They just hadn't found them yet. Columbus had hit on two little islands in the Caribbean. But look at that line. You can see that Portugal would have been granted a tiny bit of what's today Brazil. But look to the left there. The very next year, Spain and Portugal signed the Treaty of Tordesillas. That's a city in Spain where they met and signed a treaty. And they agreed, and the Pope ultimately ratified, moving his line about 500 miles to the west. And you can see that most of Brazil it was now deemed to be Portugal-controlled territory. Gosh, folks, what language do they speak in Brazil today? What language do the people speak in almost all of the New World? So this line had some impact on a, a his world history, didn't it? And notice the line through the Pacific. Well, when Pope Alexander VI drew this line of 1493, they didn't know about the Pacific Ocean. Magellan, uh, Balboa, of course, crosses Panama in 1513. He walked out into the surf, claimed this entire ocean, which they called the South Sea, and he claimed it for Spain. But the first ship that rounded South America was Magellan in 1521. And he also made these international law claims to uh, the Pacific Ocean. So later, Spain and Portugal had to decide where does Pope Alexander's line of demarcation go through the Pacific? And so look at the bottom right hand of this map. In the city of Zaragoza, Spain and Portugal sign another treaty in 1529, eight years after Magellan rounded South America. And when was it that Vasco da Gama rounded Africa? I believe that was 1498. And he arrived or other Portuguese traders landed in India. I don't know that date, but soon thereafter. So they knew there was, uh, well, okay, with Magellan, they find out there's an entire another in ocean that is massive. Where do we draw this line? And you can see where they drew that line by treaty. And I'm telling you, this is international law, and it, it became law that other governments complied with. What does international law mean, folks? It's the rules that nations agree among themselves will control their actions. And this line of demarcation, Spain and Portugal said, let's not fight wars with each other over these areas. The world's large. You claim all the lands over there. We'll claim all the lands over here. But what's interesting is how Holland and France and England also complied. They, they objected at first because they were left out of these papal bulls. And don't, of course, the king of Spain or the king of France was Catholic and the king of England, Henry VII, was Catholic. So he was very worried about violating these rules because his countries were left out. I got ahead of myself a little bit. I wanted to finish my story. Notice that, that Australia is divided almost in half by this land, line of demarcation. When James Cook arrived near Sydney in 1770, he only claimed the eastern part of Australia. He went ashore, planted his flag, planted a cross, claimed the area for the King of England. He then sailed way north landed on an island that is still to this day called Possession Island. And he took possession, legal possession of the island for the King of England and then sailed away and said, we'll be back. The Dutch arrived in West Australia in 1606 and 1616, 1616, and they hung up pewter plates that said this area belongs to Holland, the Netherlands, we'll be back. So lots of countries were, were using this idea that they could land somewhere, stick their flag in the soil, stick their cross in the soil, and claim it. So this is plainly emerging international law. And in fact, this doctrine of discovery is one of the earliest forms of international law, folks. 
The international law of war developed in the 1400s, the international law of the sea, where country ships could sail, developed in the 1400s, and the doctrine of discovery. So let's, uh, I don't have time to talk about any part of this today, really, but every growth of the United States is really based on the doctrine of discovery. The legal claims made by countries to what's now the United States and then agreements that were made in treaties. Notice the Oregon country where I was born and raised, Great Britain, Russia, Spain, and the United States claimed it. We claimed it because of Robert Gray that found the Columbia River and named it in 1790. We claimed it because Lewis and Clark went out there and built a fort at the mouth of the Columbia River. And then John Jacob Astor built his fort at the town called Astoria, named after himself, which is still there today, a fur trading post in 1811. The English claimed it. We'll talk about that a little. Well, no, that's that's a different talk I'm giving. You'll have to have me back for another talk. I digress. I'm supposed to be talking about New England, aren't I? Uh, don't get me started on other areas of the earth. I'll talk for two hours. Okay. You may go, look at this case and go, wow, 1823 Johnson v. McIntosh. Why is he talking about that? Well, this is when the United States Supreme Court adopted for the United States, for United States law, jurisprudence of the court, they adopted the doctrine of discovery. This case was about land in Illinois, what's now Illinois, and it was between two non-Indians, of course, two Americans. But the case was so old, folks, that it was actually about English law because the dispute between these parties began in 1773 and 1775. They just took 50 years to make it to the U.S. Supreme Court. So this case was literally about what is English law of colonization? How can an English citizen buy land from Indian tribes, from Indian peoples? What property rights does this Indian nation own? And how can the United States acquire it? I teach federal Indian law and I have since 1993. This is the case you start with. Chief Justice John Marshall, our most famous chief justice, wrote this case and two others that, uh, on Indian issues. They're called the Marshall Trilogy, and that's what you really start uh, teaching Indian law with. But this case was all about who had the right to buy the land from these Indian nations. Mr. Johnson, whose grandfather had allegedly bought these lands in 1773, or Mr. McIntosh, who bought the land from the United States after the United States signed a treaty with these tribes and allegedly acquired the land in that fashion. So I don't know that I have much time to go too much further into the facts of that case, but here's what this case is about. I have three points. Chief Justice John Marshall said this country, and he means the United States, was settled on discovery and conquest. What does he mean by discovery? He means the first Euro Christian European that arrived, planted their flag and their cross, and claimed the rights. Now, that comes exactly from the papal bulls. And there's no question that what I just said is true because Marshall, although he discusses it pretty briefly, he looks back at the previous 400 years. He mentions the papal bulls. He mentions the Spanish Portuguese explorations. He mentions the Cabots. He mentions King Henry VII and how England came to acquire allegedly the recognized, internationally recognized rights in what's now New England and in most of the United States at that time. What did this do to Indian peoples and Indian nations? Well, this is what Marshall said. It limited their land rights. That's what we lawyers, you know, a real estate agent sells land. Real property is land. And so the tribes, without being asked, without being paid, without even knowing about it, allegedly lost some of their ownership rights when that European Christian waded through the surf and stuck their flag and cross, or when Meriwether Lewis branded trees and, and uh, cliff faces in the Oregon country. What's the other main point from Johnson v. McIntosh? Tribes also lost some of their sovereign rights. 
And I'm looking at the clock to be sure I stay on time because when I get started talking discovery. Now, many people have written about Johnson v. McIntosh. As I told you, it's a major Indian law case. I dare say everyone that teaches at any law school that teaches an Indian law class, you start with Johnson v. McIntosh. So but I have added something new to all this literature because I broke it down into its elements. If any of you are lawyers, you are familiar with the use of the element of a crime or of a tort. So for those of you who are not uh, lawyers, folks, if the government charges you with a burglary, there are three or four elements of the charge of burglary that they must prove every one of those elements beyond a reasonable doubt if they are to convict you of the underlying crime of burglary. So because I'm a lawyer, I read Johnson v. McIntosh and I looked at it and after reading it about 10 times, I thought, hey, what, what, what is the doctrine of discovery? What are the elements? So I will go over these very quickly, but I came up with 10 of them by reading Chief Justice Marshall's opinion and how he justified European and then American claims to land and sovereignty over the indigenous nations. So like I said, I'll go through these pretty quickly. First discovery. Well, we've already seen that in the papal bulls. We've already seen that in the claims that Spain and Portugal made. If they arrived first, they had the right to colonize, develop, enslave those native peoples. Queen Elizabeth I, however, added a new element to this. Now, how good your, your knowledge of history? She was not Catholic, was she? And in fact, she was excommunicated, but she still wanted to pay attention to these papal bulls and these arguments that Spain and Portugal had made because she wanted English claims to be recognized internationally. She didn't want to have to fight wars with England and, and Port uh, Spain and Portugal if she could avoid it. So she believed in the, this emerging international law. When she chartered Sir Walter Raleigh and I think it was Sir Humphrey Gilbert to attempt the first English colony on Roanoke Island, uh, she sent them forth with a charter that doesn't look that different from the New England charter that uh, originally created where you folks created the English claims to where you are. But Elizabeth added and her lawyers added the idea of Spain and Portugal. You might have arrived there 50 years ago and maybe you stuck your flag in the cross in the in the, the surf. But if you do not come back within a reasonable length of time and actually occupy the area, we England, Protestant England, will ignore your pre-existing first discovery claim. So the race was on around the world to actually colonize areas, build a fort, put some soldiers there, build a trading post. This is exactly what happened in the Pacific Northwest, folks. That is exactly why Thomas Jefferson sent Lewis and Clark to the mouth of the Columbia River and told them to build a fort there. That was to back up the first discovery claim of the Columbia River that our, your Boston, hey, he's a, he was a Boston merchant uh, hunting sea otter furs, and he found the Columbia River in 1790. Okay, next one. I'm a, I said I'd go faster. What did Europeans acquire? Well, what Chief Justice Marshall and what our founding fathers called this was the right of preemption. The discovering European Christian country that found a new island or found a new piece of continent had the first claim to buy that land from the Indian peoples. Other European countries were supposed to stay away. That was the emerging law. Indian title, the Supreme Court uses that word, that idea only four times. I've researched it, but state courts use this title hundreds of times. What rights did the native peoples still have? And the Supreme Court has defined this. They had the right of occupancy and use of the land but they were not deemed to be the full fee simple absolute owners because some European stumbled ashore with the flag and the cross or Meriwether Lewis stumbled through your territory with a branding iron. Or James Cook arrived. Folks, I'll be giving a talk in just a, two weeks to the Alaska State Bar about how James Cook made discovery claims in Alaska by putting British coins in glass jars and burying them. 
So he was trying to prove where he had been and where he had made claims for England. Okay, you'll just have to attend that talk later. <laughs> uh, tribal sovereign and commercial rights, well, we already know they were limited. Uh, that's what, going back to Johnson v. McIntosh, look at those point two and three. That's exactly what Marshall, or what Chief Justice Marshall said the doctrine of discovery is. So that's where I got these two ideas. Contiguity. How large of an area did a Euro, an Euro American country claim when they arrived just at a river mouth, for example? Well, I got to take you back to the map of the United States, folks. What's the Louisiana Territory? What are the borders of the Louisiana Territory? Have you ever thought of this? What, is, what created the borders of what's called the Oregon country? It's the drainage system of a river. In the Louisiana territories, uh, in the case of the Louisiana territory, it's the Western drainage system of the Mississippi River. President Jefferson directed Lewis and Clark to go to the mouth of the Missouri River to find out how large this territory is that the United States had apparently acquired rights to. The battle in the Pacific Northwest was what's the drainage system of the Columbia River. So this is my element of contiguity. How big of an area could you claim? King James I, when he sent his colonists to North America and your areas, he claimed 100 English miles around anywhere an Englishman built a house or a farm. So King James I was using this idea, this element I called contiguity, and so did other European countries. That map of the Pacific Northwest, folks, do you remember how James Pope ran for president, what his slogan was? 54, 40, or fight. What was he talking about? Today, there's probably not an American alive that knows. Look at the Columbia River, folks, how far it went up into modern-day British Columbia. He was claiming that we own the entire British Columbia because it's the drainage system of the Columbia River. Okay, again, I hope I didn't digress. I got to keep an eye on the clock. Um, terra nullius, it's Latin for empty earth. If the land is empty and there are no human beings there, well, of course, the first European that shows up can claim it. Folks like me, if you were, what would we say when we were little kids? Finders, keepers, losers, weepers. And we also, what we learn as little kids? Possession's nine-tenths of the law. If I had a piece of gum, you know, you're not getting it. I have it. Those are property principles that we were taught as our parent, by our parents that are literally part of law. Terra nullius is how England claimed Australia for about 150 years until their Supreme Court in 1992 said that is a lie. This continent was not empty. Aboriginal peoples had lived here for 100,000 years, and we have to fix this. It's kind of stunning that the Australian Supreme Court made that Mabo decision in 19, uh, 1992. My, I, had to, I ran out of room, so I, threw, I squeezed three of my elements into this last uh, piece. Conquest. Military conquest acquires land and sovereignty, but Johnson v. McIntosh defines conquest in two ways. When a European showed up with their flag and the cross or Mary Lewis, Meriwether Lewis with his branding iron, it's as if that European country had won a war over uh, these indigenous peoples. We, you and I have already talked about Christianity and civilization. The papal bulls put that obligation on Portugal as early as 1436 in Africa in the 1450s, and then put the same obligation on Spain in those papal bulls in the 1493. American Indian policy is all about Christianity and civilization. If you know anything about American history, the US claimed the same duty and how it was gonna take care of Indian peoples and help civilize them and convert them. Uh, the boarding schools, my mother went to boarding school in Oklahoma. These were supposed to be fonts of civilization and educate these ignorant savages. Uh, anyway, you can hear the sarcasm in my voice. I will get off that point. But now let's talk about England because now we're talking about New England. And we're talking about the charters that created English colonies and later American states where you're sitting right now. I've already mentioned Henry VII. 
Uh, I have a space bar that literally is blocking my view of that, so I can't see what it says, but hopefully I remember well enough. Henry VII was a Catholic monarch, as I mentioned earlier, was very worried about being excommunicated if he breached uh, or violated Spain's claims to the lands in the New World, but he still had a lot of greed too. And so he sent John Cabot and his sons forth under a charter that said, discover for me lands that no other Christian prince has yet found. Now that's a quote. So if you run into the Spanish anywhere, back off. But if there's land with no Europeans there, no European Christians, claim it for me. So even though, and this is, of course, England's claim from Newfoundland to Virginia, folks, were the voyages of the Cabots in those years. I've already mentioned Elizabeth I, and she's not Catholic, but she still wanted the international law of colonialism to work in her favor. And she added that element of actual occupancy. Now, James I, of course, is the monarch that really impacts our American history and the colonies on the East Coast. The 1606 charter that became Virginia uh, is loaded with doctrine of discovery elements, my 10 elements. So now we're going back to that and looking at the application of uh, where you live and the history of, of your colonies and states. But we're going to focus on the charter that created your area. Uh, here's where we get into some history. I hope I don't make a mistake. I've been doing research. The Charter of New England covered an enormous area of land, folks. I have it right here. King James I, if you want to just see it, it's really a, a long and tiny print Boring read, but I did it. <laughs> Look at this. He thought he was granting land through the New England Charter. I, you can't see that, but from the 34th to the 45th degree of parallel. That is an area I've looked on several maps, practically South Carolina up into the middle part of Maine. Now, that's literally in violation of the charter he had given Virginia. 14 years earlier. So there's a provision in here that says if this charter overlaps with any of the other charters the English king had give, given, you're supposed to read it like there's no violation. So I have another map here that shows what the, the charter of New England is, and it looks like it's from about Long Island Sound north, about halfway up into Maine. So that's your area. So it's not yet the Massachusetts Bay, it's just all New England. And so that charter of 1620 was a predecessor to your charter, your, for the charter for the colony of Ma Massachusetts Bay colony of 1629, nine years later. So within just nine years, King James started break, breaking up. And in fact, your charter by 1629 is by King Charles. And so they started making more colonies out of what had been the enormous colony of New England. But so we need to start with what King James I put in the Charter of New England, because that is definitely applicable to your Massachusetts Bay Colony. Look at, he used most of my 10 elements, pure and simple. First discovery, if no other Christian prince possessed this land in New England, then his colony could use it, claim it, and own it. He said, we, he, he, this is a funny claim, actually, but and it's a quote. He says, we have taken actual possession of the continent. Really? Were there English people everywhere on the continent? I mean, that's just a joke. But he, he knows to claim to make this element of discovery, this actual possession that his immediate predecessor, Elizabeth I, had created. And notice the entire continent. And then look at the next line. He said, we own it sea to sea, meaning the Atlantic clear to the South Sea. They guessed it was out there. That's what they called it. I have read sometimes they thought it was about 100 miles away. They did not know it was 3,000 miles away. Now, some people would say that's kind of a audacious, even ballsy. Oh, I shouldn't have said that. Claim to own the whole continent because... The Cabots planted a flag, you know, in the 1490s. 
And now a few Englishmen have gone there. I know there was an attempted colony in New England that failed in 1607 by George Popham. Everyone died and the few that didn't went back to England. Um, so there was an attempted colony before then the uh, permanent one of 1620 got established. But look at the rest of these elements. Sovereignty. King James I created a corporate entity. How intriguing. You know, I don't practice corporate law, but I, I know a bit about it. And to read him setting up this corporation called Plymouth in Devon, England, that would operate these, this company and was given this charter with this name now of New England. They were given sovereignty. They were given trade rights. They didn't have to pay English taxes, import or custom taxes, uh, because the king was wanting this private company to undertake this development. I, I forgot to say this earlier. The English kings and queens were cheapskates. They didn't pay for these explorations. They chartered these private corporations to make the investments and take the risk, as Walter Raleigh and Humphrey Gilbert did in 1587. And then if they turned out really well, then the king sometimes took them back. And that's exactly what happened with many of the American colonies. But anyway, he granted these kind of powers to the, this board of directors of this company, this corporation he created. He said, Terra Nullius, and I'll tell you, this will give you a chill. What James I wrote in the 1620 charter, he said, I have heard of wonderful plagues that God has sent on the natives that live there. And he's making that land available for me. Now, that is the Terra Nullius argument the terra nullius element of my land. One of the early, I think I'm going by memory now, John Winthrop's, one of the famous ministers, maybe of Massachusetts, I don't know, you know better than me. I can almost quote a phrase he said also in 1640 about the epidemics that were wiping out the indigenous people. And he also, I think this is a quote, God hath hereby cleared our title, close quote. I'm certain I have that right. So this minister, this loving man of God, uh, good, the Indians are dying, and so we get the land. That was terra nullius, pure and simple. James I also instructed these, uh, this corporation that he gave this charter to that you must enlarge the Christian religion. You must convert the, that's not sausages, that's the word he used for savages, and civilize them. Now, I guess I should count that. That's about eight of my 10 elements from Johnson v. McIntosh. Now, I've emphasized this quite a lot, again, because this is the forerunner to your Massachusetts Bay Colony Charter nine years later. And that's really my last slide. So let's turn to that. So like I said, Charles, the, the King Charles, I think he was the first, he starts making smaller colonies, making more colonies as they succeeded. Uh, he wanted more Englishmen there, more land, more empire, more riches. And so here's the charter of your uh, colony. And he repeated much of the 1620 charter to New England of 1620. There's less direct use of my elements here. So that's, of course, why I emphasized the, the charter to New England. So this is the, his immediate successor. James I was his immediate predecessor as King of England. And so he incorporated and quoted from the charter for New England. And so he was incorporating, he and his lawyers then were incorporating and repeating these elements of the international law doctrine of discovery. What else? Now he limited, or, you know, I don't know why he said this, because the Charter of New England plainly claims the 34th to the 45th parallel, degree of parallel, 34th to the 45th parallel. But now he defines New England as the 40th to the 48th degree. I had a map a few seconds ago. Where did I put it? I don't know if you can see this. This is just straight off Wikipedia. Where's my camera? Can you see that map? And so they're showing the colony of calling it the Plymouth Company from about the 38th degree of parallel to the 41st. 
So the, there's seemingly difference on what happened. Did Charles the first know exactly what the 40th to the 48th degree of latitude did? I don't know, but look at the same claim from C to C. Wow. He also, as the colony, the charter for New England did, he set out all sorts of rights of this governing council that they would have permanent rights. They would decide who would succeed. There would be 40 of them to run this, uh, this colony. They had the right of trade, that jurisdiction. They acquired land rights. Gosh, what about all the native peoples there? What about the native nations that had lived there for thousands and thousands of years? They had the right to enact laws. So he was creating government they could put people in jail. They could fight off invaders. Again, they didn't have to pay English taxes. He was encouraging this private company to invest the money there and to create this uh, colony, the Massachusetts Bay Colony. Look what he says. So First Discovery and other Christians. He says in this charter, if there's other Christian princes in possession of any parts of this grant that he's giving to the Massachusetts Bay Colony, he says, then his grant is void. He was absolutely recognizing first discovery, my first element, and look at the word possession. He's absolutely using that second element that Queen Elizabeth I created and added to this international law, that of act, being in actual possession. So I think, let's see what time it is. So I think that's about as much as I have to say at the moment. Oh, oh, I forgot this. Look at this quote. Now, if this isn't hypocrisy, hypocrisy, I don't know what is. He orders the company that he creates to run this Massachusetts Bay colony. Oh, you're supposed to civilize the natives and convert them. So there's two more of my elements. And gosh, he says, oh, isn't that the principal end of this plantation? Quote, unquote. Yeah, yeah, you really cared about the natives, didn't you? What did James I say? He was delighted that God was killing them off with uh, wonderful plagues. Kind of chilling, actually. Okay, it's time for just, oh, oh, I do want to say this. If this interests you more, there is a brand new article. And I'm holding it in my hand. And this professor researched all the colonial laws of most of these colonies. Massachusetts is first. I don't, he didn't go in alphabetical order, so I don't know why he did this, but he's got Massachusetts, Rhode Island, Maine. Uh, I'm not going to thumb through them all, but he sets out the colonial laws that had to do, well, it says affecting indigenous peoples of Southern New England. That's you folks. So if any of you want to see the research he did and many of these laws, folks, I've done this research in Virginia. I wrote an article on slavery in Virginia. And I looked at, about four years ago, I looked at all the colonial laws that, of Virginia that mentioned native peoples at all. And there was a lot of the doctrine of discovery, my 10 elements in the laws that Virginia had enacted. And so I just ran across this article like about a month ago. Many of these laws that he and his researchers found are also the doctrine of discovery elements as they're applied by law in these colonies in Southern New England. Okay, so, I'm a, so now's the time for some commercials. Eileen, do I get, a, get away with giving a commercial? You absolutely but, do, yes. <laughs> well, this is the, the first book I ever wrote. Uh, this is the book that Eileen mentioned earlier. So that's about American Manifest Destiny. The longest chapter in my book, folks, I argue by using my 10 elements and looking at American history, how the United States government used those 10 elements to make claims across the continent. I claim that manifest destiny is exactly the doctrine of discovery being used in the continent of the United States. And the other book that Eileen mentioned, I wrote with indigenous peoples from Australia, New Zealand, and Canada. We look at how England applied the doctrine of discovery in all four of our countries. I, I got to tell you, this painting was given to us to use by a Canadian uh, First Nations person in Canada, and you can't see the full cover. There's three ships there. Guess whose three ships those are? The Nina, the Pinta, and the Santa Maria, and the native has a cross stuck in his forehead, and this painting is called 1492. 
So I, I think you can't see the cross, but that's a pretty powerful statement of what the doctrine of discovery did to indigenous peoples and what it still does today, folks. The doctrine of discovery and Johnson v. McIntosh is still federal Indian law today. If you have ever heard the phrase trust lands and that Indian nations own trust lands, what does that mean? It means the United States is the legal owner of that land and the tribe is only the beneficial owner. Citation to authority, Johnson v. McIntosh, the papal bulls, the charter of Massachusetts Bay Colony. That doctrine of discovery has impacted history and is still the law today. In fact, I'll give you a statutory site. 25 United States Code Section 177 sets out that the United States is the legal owner of Indian lands. And again, in my class, I make a joke all the time and ask my students, citation to authority? Where, where do you get authority for that statement? Johnson v. McIntosh, the papal bulls, the doctrine of discovery. So my school is putting on a conference on March the 10th. It's entitled Unraveling the Doctrine of Discovery. And you're welcome to join. We'll be sending out, you know, it's a Zoom talk. We have a speaker from Africa, from New Zealand, from Australia. I'm trying to get uh, some Sami people from Scandinavia, maybe a speaker from India, and of course from Canada. So we are going to put on maybe a six or eight hour conference on March the 10th, which is the 200 year anniversary of Johnson v. McIntosh. Oh. Thank you again. Thank you, Eileen. Thank you for the history. Yeah, so Bob, stay with us. So, uh, yes. Wow. And if you send me the information on the conference, we'll be sure to share it with people who are at this, this program today. Great, thank you. I think you used the term chilling early in your remarks, and, and certainly that was a feeling I had as, as you went on uh, looking at the language in these documents. Uh, so we're gonna have someone with a microphone going around for the live in-person audience. And then we also have some questions, I think, coming in on Zoom. So let me just hand off a microphone first. Please just ask easy questions. <laughs> test, test. So I know we do have some on Zoom already, but if any, okay, Jane, uh, you wanna start us off? I'm going to start with one in the room. Um, this is really not a question, but it's an observation. I was on a trip to Antarctica, and they made a whole point about Antarctica being owned by all of the countries. But yet, there were several countries that kept small little bases. England, for one, has four people that live there all year long, so that they have, put, and I think it's this possession that you're talking about. Did that make sense to you? I couldn't hear the last part. I think there are treaties between those seven countries and they just share occupation and, and use there. I don't think any country claims ownership of Antarctica. Is that? No, but are they afraid to leave? I think they want, to, they want that occupation that I think it's part of this possession idea. So they keep their eye on each other, I guess. <laughs> Let me mention something to you folks. I was giving this talk on August the 2nd, 2007, on a reservation up in northwestern Washington. And someone in the audience asked me, and they said, did you see what Russia did today? And I go, well, heck no. What, what are you talking about? Russia, on August the 2nd, 2007, sent a submarine two and a half miles below the ocean and planted its flag at the North Pole. And do you know why? 25% of the Earth's known oil and gas reserves are under the North Pole. In August of 2010, have you been following how China and Japan and Vietnam and the Philippines, I guess, are arguing over rights to South China Sea? And China sent a submarine in August 2010 and planted the, Rush, the Chinese flag on the bottom of, the, of that ocean, that sea. And since then, China has been building islands. They've been building up atolls and, and bringing in sand and gravel and stuff, and then building buildings and putting soldiers in them. Now, if that's not my element of first discovery, and then the second element from Elizabeth I of actual occupancy, I don't know what is. 
And NATO said they're not going to let Russia claim all this oil. And for a while, there were ships sailing all around there. And that has quieted down. I haven't heard much about that. But, you know, is there going to be war in the South China Sea? Do you know that American and Chinese ships are now sailing very close to each other? We're having jets, fighter jets, fly real close to each other because the U.S. is trying to contest China's claim to sole sovereignty in the South China Sea. So these aren't just uh, old historical, non-important uh, issues that I'm talking about today. For indigenous peoples, it's daily life. And with what Russia and China, did. so I got to finish my story. So when this guy in the audience says, did you hear what Russia did today? And then he tells me, he says, okay, talk's over. Or no, I said, talk's over. I got to go write an editorial. And it was published the next day in the LA Times. <laughs> so you got to keep up on the news. <laughs> okay. So we're Next going to take question. a question from Zoom, Sarah. Okay. Where does the doctrine of dis discovery rest in international law today? If it has been discredited as in Australia, what is the retroactive legal impact, if any? It has been discredited nowhere else. Every country still uses it as, you know, do people even know about it anymore? No, it's just something that happened in history. But the colonial claims, the rights of the borders of countries, they're still set in stone. Where we drew the 49th parallel between Canada and us became a negotiation between the U.S. James K. Polk ran for office on 54, 40, or fight. But as soon as he became president, we negotiated away that issue and drew the borderline where it is at the 49th degree of parallel. Nobody wanted a war over British Columbia. You know, what was up there? But that's funny that he, run for off, he ran for office on that claim. I didn't make that much about it, folks, but that tells you how much I'm trying to get out of the sun here. You know, I'm in Phoenix. I was surprised to hear you say it's 72 where you are. Yes. Uh, anyway, I'm still in the sun a little bit. Yes, you are. Uh, but we'll, we'll deal with it. We've got another question from the room. Um, I've done some reading on the uh, last days of the Comanches uh, and also visited some exhibits like at the Heard Museum on the Indian um, schools in Phoenix. Uh, it, it, it just, I, I guess my question is, did the Indians not have any sort of formalized um, court system or way of governing that the invaders essentially would have to go to because when they they were transgressed upon they had to go to an English court so they had to go into enemy territory to plead their case yes and how do you think that turned out um all indigenous cultures in the world, I mean, this covers a whole range. In the United States, even today, there are some tribes in Alaska that might be 40 people. And then you have some of the tribes in Oklahoma that have 20 some thousand people. And the Navajo Nation has 430,000, or no, excuse me, Cherokee Nation has 430,000. Navajo has over 300,000 citizens. Each one of these cultures had control mechanisms, had laws. They didn't have courts that looked like the English judge with a wig and a robe, but a society cannot exist for thousands of years without some sort of dispute mechanic, dispute resolution mechanism. So I'm not an expert on this, but I've studied a little bit about this. Tribes used elders to solve problems, to literally hear cases. But tribes had to get along. And so they didn't, most of them didn't have a jail. You all might be surprised to hear that some tribes, tribal cultures practiced capital punishment. The Cherokee Nation would kill people, execute them. Uh, some tribes practiced corporal punishment. But most tribal cultures that I'm aware of in what's now the United States mostly used a mocking humor excise you from the community, banishment, you would know that. Uh, and that was a control mechanism because to be banned from the tribal camp was almost like a death sentence. You and your family had to leave and be out on your own. There's an excellent book from 1941, folks. It's called The Cheyenne Way. And it's written by a Harvard contracts professor and America's leading sociologist at the time. 
and they analyzed the Northern Cheyenne tribe that's in Montana. I used to work for the Northern Cheyenne tribes housing authority. But this book is written like it's a law book, and it analyzed the Cheyenne culture and law. And each chapter was like on criminal law, divorce law, agriculture law, hunting law, that sort of thing. And so this Harvard law professor and this sociologist perceived law in this, what would we, what, what word should I use? But I mean, in this group of people, that had controlled themselves for a long time. So they didn't have a court that looked like an English court or an American court, which I think that's sort of what your question was, but they certainly controlled their own conduct. People that caused trouble were dealt with in whatever way that tribal culture did. So having a judicial system, having a police force is something that tribal cultures knew about. The dog soldiers is what the Lakota people they were in charge of the camp. They were in charge of movement. And boy, if you didn't do what you were ordered, there was punishment. Most tribes had a chief in charge of the, the planting and when to harvest. And in some tribes, these were women. My tribe had female chiefs. Uh, the hunt was, was important to hunt buffalo herds intelligently and carefully. And there were chiefs in charge of those hunts. And if you transgress the rules of the hunt and of that chief, there was punishment. So if I followed your question, yes, we absolutely had government, governance, laws, and dispute mechanisms, dispute resolution mechanisms. Another question from Zoom. What research has or is being done about parallel laws and practices on the parts of the indigenous people, if there are any parallels? Does, I, I assume this means comparing indigenous groups to other indigenous groups. Uh, a scholar does not spring to my mind, but there are certainly uh, Reynard Strickland, who has passed away. Uh, he's uh, Oklahoma Cherokee. He wrote a book called The Fire and the Spirits in 1975. And it's an intriguing book that backs up what I just talked about, that the Cherokee practiced capital punishment in some circumstances, had laws and governments. Tribes had constitutions even, folks. The oldest written constitution is claimed to be from your area of the country, the oldest constitution in the U.S., by the Iroquois Confederacy, um, upstate New York mostly, written with wampum belts, the Iroquois Confederacy, which is actually six different tribes that became the Iroquois Confederacy. Gosh, now you can see my living room. <laughs> I'm trying to get out of the sun. Um, so there's one book and one scholar I'm thinking of. Uh, gosh, I'm just blanking on, who, but there are people that are, have analyzed specific tribes. I'm not sure how many have then written it in a comparative analysis of Indian nation A to Indian nation B. So I'm wondering if the question is getting at, did uh, natives either in North America or elsewhere claim territory, you know, expand their sphere of influence by claiming things using the same kind of points in your doctrine of discovery? Oh, that interesting. Uh, absolutely, tribes knew their territories. They knew their hunting grounds, and they would protect them. Uh, the Black Hills case is an interesting one. Uh, the Crow Nation and the Lakota peoples ended up with rights in the Black Hills when the Europeans showed up and Americans. But there are claims that they took the, the Black Hills from the uh, Arapaho, and maybe it's Crow that were driven out by Lakota. And the Lakota peoples are allegedly were driven out of the Minnesota woods, the Western woods by Chippewa, Ojibwe peoples. So I don't know a whole lot about that history, but there is that uh, statement made. Yes, there was some fighting between tribes and, and absolutely a knowledge of where your borders were and where your rights were. Hunting grounds were often shared because there was enough game for the, the people, the, the tribes in the immediate area. My own tribe practiced some unique forms of property rights. When they went hunting, you, if you shot a deer and it was down, you would leave a piece of your clothing on that deer and keep on hunting. You found a honey tree, you'd put some kind of mark on it. So in one sense, well, I mean, I think 
too many Americans think Indian peoples didn't understand culture, didn't understand economics. That is false. That's one of the main topics I teach at Arizona State Law. Uh, I've written on that too. Okay, I think I got the question this time. Yeah. So I, I have a question, and, and that is, um, I, I'm imagining that soldiers who might have been uh, sent to occupy a fort might have realized that they were there for this purpose of possession that would further the interests of the country that they were from. Um, I'm just imagining that, that, that they may have realized they had that job to do. But what about settlers who came over uh, from England um, or perhaps other places when you talk about Spain and Portugal, uh, do you think that they were knowledgeable that they were playing a role for the country or were they just said, oh, there's some land, you have big farms, so there's opportunity for you. It, did, were they drawn by the opportunity or were they drawn by this sense of obligation to further the goals of their king, queen, whomever? You know, I know you know. Well, well you said settlers. So are you talking the 1700s and 1800s? If you're talking the 1400s and 1500s, these conquistadors and explorers were absolutely carrying the flag and the cross of their crown. They were also, of course, hoping to find gold and silver and get super rich. So they had their own private interests. Now, if you're talking to immigration to the U.S. in the 1700s, 1800s and early 1900s, I think these were people drawn by this idea that there's free land and they wouldn't have to be a serf, you know, or, or just an employee in England or Germany or whatever. Uh, the U.S. used the settlers as I started to say pawns. Uh, they didn't know themselves they were being used as pawns, but the U.S. was pushing its border. Do you, as soon as Lewis and Clark went to the Oregon country, Thomas Jefferson wanted American occupation of the Pacific Northwest. John Jacob Astor writes him a letter in 1808 when Jefferson was still the president. And John Jacob Astor is so smart. He says, oh, I'm thinking of building a fur post on the Pacific Ocean. Oh, maybe at the mouth of the Columbia River. And I picture Thomas Jefferson doing cartwheels down the hall in the White House. He writes him back. And I can quote you. He says, I will give you all the support the executive can provide, period, close quote. Jefferson wanted an American permanent uh, actual occupancy in the Oregon country because Jefferson was a lawyer. Jefferson knew about this law that our founding fathers called preemption. They didn't call it the doctrine of discovery. My element uh, three, they called it preemption. And our first Congress put that word preemption in one of the first Indian laws it enacted. Congress number one, July 22, 1790, put the word preemption and the idea of the doctrine of discovery in a statute in 1790. So it's interesting once you learn something new. I mean, I just see the doctrine of discovery everywhere I look. Yeah. And, and, and so I hope I've given you a new lens to look at historical facts and how the law played a role in things that we just sort of assume is just historical only. I'll tell you, I gave my Doctrine of Discovery talk to at Lewis and Clark events across the country. My tribe appointed me to be one of the representatives to the Lewis and Clark Bicentennial. And so I gave this talk all over. And people that love Lewis and Clark are called Clarkies. And the Clarkies were so happy to hear my talk because here was a whole new way to look at the expedition and to think about the things they did day to day, that it was about international law, maybe. And Meriwether Lewis knew what he was doing. Everywhere he went, he made claims over the native people. He said, you now, they carried medallions with Thomas Jefferson's profile on it, medals. They're called peace medals. And they handed out 55 of them on the Lewis and Clark expedition across the continent. And they told these chiefs, here's your new father. This is a quote, folks. They, Meriwether Lewis wrote a letter, 2,500 word letter to a chief, an Oto chief that was missing from the conference they held with the Oto tribe. And so he wrote him a letter. I have no idea if he could read it, but we know what the letter is because they wrote it in the journals. And they gave this speech to every tribe they encountered, which was more than 50. They held more than 50, two and three day diplomatic conferences 
with tribal governments as they went across the continent. And that's when they would hand out these medals. And here's what they told them. This, your old fathers, the Spanish, the French, and the English, they're gone. This is American territory now. And they would hold up that emblem of Jefferson. They'd go, here is your new great white father. Do what he says, and it will go well with you. So sorry, I digressed into that. Uh, I forget so the question I was answering now. <laughs> yeah. So we have another question from Zoom. Yeah. I heard that Ruth Bader Ginsburg cited the doctrine of discovery. Can you explain that? In 2005, she wrote, oh, Johnson v. McIntosh gets cited all the time. Folks, and I want to tell you, Canadian courts, Canadian courts have cited Johnson v. McIntosh about 70 times. Australian courts have cited Johnson v. McIntosh about 50 times. And news courts of New Zealand have cited it about 30 times. It's a very persuasive case. The English Privy Council, which is the highest court, or at least was, I don't know anything about the English legal system. The English Privy Council was the highest court in England. And they made decisions in, about Africa and about Canada and cited Johnson v. McIntosh three times. So that case is enormously important. Now I've almost, I've forgotten the question. What was it, please? About Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Oh, yes. Kirk, yeah. So the, I, I, got, I had digressed, but uh, the Supreme Court, of course, cites Johnson v. McIntosh quite often, hundreds of times. But the most recent is in 2005 in a case called City of Cheryl versus the Oneida Indian Nation. And it's about lands in upstate New York. And she wrote the opinion, tribes were very unhappy with the Oneida Indian Nation, was very unhappy with the opinion. And in footnote one, she cites the doctrine of discovery with a citation to Johnson v. McIntosh. Another question from Zoom. Does the doctrine of discovery have any implications for outer space, specifically exploitation of the moon? <laughs> In my regular talks, I always go, what's that? What did we do on the moon in 1969? We planted a Who plant. owns those moon rocks we brought home? And I always joke, if we could build, a, if there was oil up there and we could build a pipeline, we'd sure claim that, wouldn't we? Now, I want to tell you guys an interesting twist on that. Richard Nixon had some moon rocks broken into little pieces and he put them in plexiglass uh, paperweights and he gave out like 150 of them to world leaders a little piece of moon rock in a plastic container. One of those came for sale, like on eBay or something, in sort of the black market. And the United States sued to get it back and claimed it still owned that rock. That's a district, a circuit court of appeals case from Washington, D.C. in 2000. And it's just kind of stunning. It, it's not really the doctrine of discovery, but it is kind of the U.S. still owns those moon rocks. So absolutely, we put our flag on the moon. And the United Nations has a treaty for outer space, folks. And 14 countries, only 14, have signed that treaty that space would be shared, not used for war. Now, guess which 14 countries signed that treaty? Not countries that will ever send a rocket into outer space. Not Russia, not China, not us, not England. I forget the 14 countries that signed it are like Costa Rica, you know, what, you know, countries that will never have it. So I don't, if there was gold to be found on the moon, we would be mining it and we would be keeping it because we were there first. I guess we haven't actually occupied it. We did drive a car across the road, right? <laughs> okay, sorry. We have another question in the room. Yeah, and I'm not quite sure how to ask this, but colonial governments signed treaties with native peoples and funds changed hands. Did the fact that they do that not imply that the native peoples had some rights over those lands or were any rights implied by that kind of a sale? Well, thank you. I, I thought your question was going to go in a different direction. Absolutely. The fact that every European country that came to this continent and then the United States signed treaties with tribes is a recognition of sovereignty, that this is a nation. Nations don't sign treaties with uh, racial groups or, you know, I don't have a treaty with Russia that, you know, 
So these European countries realized who owns these lands, or at least who has some rights to it. Who do I need to buy these rights from if I'm going to claim it? And so that's what they were doing through treaties. England and its colonies signed about 100 treaties with uh, Indian nations. Indian leaders sometimes went to England. Uh, who is it? Squanto? Is Squanto from Massachusetts? Or maybe wrote what's now Rhode Island. I see some Squanto saved those pilgrims by teaching them how to plant corn and put a fish, uh, you know, corn, beans, and squash, the three great crops, and put a dead fish in for fertilizer. I think Squanto even went to England. Anyway, I'm digressing. But what the question I thought you were going to ask me is, does the United States have legitimate title to these lands since it did sign treaties? That is a valid legal argument. The leading writer in Indian law is Felix Cohen. He died about 1953, but man, has he been a, a giant in Indian law. And he wrote an article in 1947. He said the United States can point to a piece of paper, a treaty, or some sort of agreement and payment for almost every acre of land in the lower 48 states. So that's what I thought you were going to ask me. Mm -hmm. And then the argument is, were those fair? Was alcohol and bribery and force used? Could the Indians read English? No. Could they read the document they were signing? No. Who brought lawyers to the meetings? Just the United States. Not, you know, so anyway, that's, I thought you were going to ask me that. So I answered it anyway. <laughs> More questions in the room? How about on Zoom? Well, thank you, Bob. This has just been uh, more than fascinating, uh, disturbing, certainly. Uh, and here we are in November in New England when many think about a holiday at the end of this month and certainly changes, I think, how many of us will think about sitting down to any dinner on, on that day in late November. Um, so um, I wanted to um, thank you not only for, for spending time with us today, but I know you did additional research in preparation for this, looking at the charters, and you held up that one that was quite voluminous with small type, uh, <laughs> that you looked at the Charter of New England and the Charter of the Massachusetts Bay Colony, um, and we really appreciate that additional work that you did for this program. So thank you very much. We look forward to getting uh, information about the upcoming programs you talked about because there may be some folks who are interested in those. Uh, we also do have some copies of uh, your book on the doctrine of discovery uh, that you co-authored in our bookstore. And we certainly invite those who are interested to, to pick up a copy while they're here. I'll uh, fly out there and sign it for you. Whoa, that's quite a, <laughs> that's quite an invitation. Yeah, we would, we would welcome you anytime you're in the area. Uh, I'll to be come there tomorrow. <laughs> to, to come and talk to us uh, informally. Uh, so before we end our Zoom, I wanted to invite all of you to begin with, to be with us again on December 4th, when we have our third program in this Native Homeland Settler Colonialism series. We talked a little bit, our speaker today talked about disease. Well, our speaker in December, Dr. David Jones, who teaches at Harvard Medical School, has written a book about epidemics during the colonization of New England. And he will join us here in person at the Hingham Heritage Museum. He lives just a little bit west of Boston. Um, and he will shed light on the life-threatening illnesses that plagued both the colonists and indigenous peoples here in the 17th and 18th century. So uh, we're all looking forward to that. I wanted to also point out that we have a new person handling the technology today. And Eric Dresser was good enough to substitute for Colin McGinnis, our normal tech wizard. And Eric came in and got trained last week and did a wonderful job for us today. Uh, so thank you to Eric. Thank you also to, to Sarah, who all of you know is on the staff of of the uh, Historical Society, but also has played an important role in managing things for us uh, for the webinar today. And all of the members of the Education Committee who helped greet you as you came in at the doors and, and uh, checked for your tickets as, as you uh, came up to the third floor. Thank you to all of those. And also thank you to Laura Thompson who provided a wonderful reception. So those of you who are here at the museum, we invite you to go to the second floor for some light refreshments and perhaps some continued conversation on this really stirring conversation. So thank you again, Bob. Thank you all.
Any uh, final words, Bob, you want to say before we end our Zoom? Just thank you for your interest and attention, and I appreciate being invited very much. I mean, I've You're certainly done a lot of work on this. My articles, I, I shouldn't say this because this my articles are available for free online. Obviously, I just wrote <laughs> one about East Africa and how England and Germany use the doctrine of discovery to claim and colonize East Africa. So it 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 applied to the whole world. Yeah, so our continuous education goes on. Thank you so much. And the Zoom, we will now end. Thank you, Eric.